Good noon, Dr. Chris Roddenberry here to talk to you about Psychology 150 today. I am sorry about the technical problems I had at the 130 live broadcast, so I've decided to re, uh, redo today's lecture uh, completely recorded so that you'll still have the information. I hope again to try for a live broadcast on Monday at 1.30, but you know how Wake Tech's technology is. So, my name is Chris Roddenberry. I will be your psych instructor for this semester, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about psychology. Today, I'm going to introduce the field of psychology for you. I'm going to be talking to you about the history of psychology. The, lec the name of today's lecture is The Four Epics of Psychology. And what I want to do today is introduce to you the field of psychology and talk to you a little bit about how it's developed throughout history so you can appreciate where we are today in the uh, modern field of psychology. Now, uh, if you look in Blackboard, you'll notice that there is a PowerPoint presentation uh, included with this video. That's the PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to be using today. You'll notice in this PowerPoint presentation, you have live links, as well as in Blackboard, you have a link to your PowerPoint, to your uh, textbook. What I'm going to ask you today to do today and throughout this semester is to use the links that I've provided with you, to you as well as the uh, textbook link that I've provided to complete the course homework that is due this Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. Remember, in order to make a C in this class, you must score 95% accuracy or better on all of your homework assignments. Now, before you get too worried, just remember, you can do these multiple these homework assignments multiple times. So if you don't get all the questions right the first time, just go back and redo the quiz. And the idea is for you at the end of this semester to have all of these basic content uh, items in your memory. So that's how we're going to do it. So if you want, what I would suggest to do is to actually open up your homework right now as you watch this lecture. Maybe get a second laptop or something and watch this lecture and answer the questions as I go over them. Occasionally, I'll direct you into the uh, uh, reading and you'll go do that to find the answers. Uh, remember, this homework is due Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. Okay. With, uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and begin this lecture. Okay, now the first thing I want to do is to tell you uh, that this is not like every other college class you're taking here. A lot of the college classes you'll take, maybe if you're taking a history class or a, a fine arts class, you may ask yourself, why exactly does this class matter to me? And you know what? Sometimes the answer might be it doesn't matter. But one of the things that I want you to know about Psychology 150 is that this class is definitely important to you, not only for your degree, but this class will help you lead a happier, healthier, and better life. So I'm going to pose the question to you. Are you as happy as you want to be? Is there something that you would like to improve? Would you like to uh, understand yourself a little bit better, your strengths, your weaknesses? Uh, would you like to become a more product productive person? Um, would you like to have better relationships with your loved ones, with your friends, with your coworkers? Are you interested in trying to figure out what the point of life is, what the meaning of life is? Maybe I can help you with that. And just in general, what I want to do is to help you lead a better, happier life. Now, if you take the textbook that we're using this semester and go through it, you can think of this as a handbook for better living. This book is going to help you improve yourself in multiple dimensions. If you'll just be willing to learn what I'm talking about and apply it to your life. And the goal of this class not only is to help you move towards your two-year AS or AA degree, but I want to help you become the master of your ship. I want you to learn how to control yourself and to control your destiny, right? And if you look right underneath me, we've got a quote by the famous Socrates, to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. 
And so what I want to help you do today is I want to help you get to know yourself a little bit better. Okay? So without further ado, let's get started on our lecture. Now, psychology, let's first define what psychology is. Now, again, this goal for you is to understand the history of psychology and to appreciate the breadth of approaches uh, and help you understand psychology. What I'd like to do is give you a definition of psychology as you're going to find it in the modern textbook. And here it is. The academic definition of psychology is the scientific study of how people think, feel, and behave with a focus on how these three things are related to the anatomy and physiology of your nervous system. All right, now let's break that down. There are three important parts to this definition. The first is it's the scientific study. Psychology is a science. We're gonna talk more about what science is next week, but science is a method of gathering information such that it gives you a higher likelihood of finding the actual truth. The goal of this class is not for me to lecture you and give you my opinion. I am not interested in giving you my, my opinion. Instead, what we are interested in in the field of psychology is understanding how people actually function. And to do this, we need to use scientific methodologies. So I want you to understand that psychology is definitely a science. The second part of this is how people think feel, and behave. The goal of psychology is to understand the psychological condition, and that involves how people think about themselves and others, how people feel in terms of their emotions, and how these emotions and thoughts cause people to behave. So that's the crux of psychology, how people think, feel, and behave. And the third part of this is with an understanding, with an idea to understanding how the nervous system controls the way we think, feel, and behave. By the nervous system, I'm talking about your cerebral cortex, your brain on top of your head, your spinal cord, and all of the nerves that go from your spinal cord to the rest of your body. So I'm interested in this semester in talking to you about the way people think, feel, and behave. We're going to study that scientifically so that we're not giving you opinions, we're giving you facts, and we're going to try to relate this to that three-pound pile of mush that sits on the top of your head. So that's what psychology is. Now, before I get started with modern psychology, I'd like to roll that back a little bit and talk about really the essential definition. Really, the essential definition of psychology is the intellectual pursuit of what it means to be human, how humans think, how humans feel, and how humans behave. Now, one way of thinking about psychology is that it's the oldest pursuit in the history of humankind. As long as we've had campfires to sit around and time to think about it, people have wondered what it means to be a human. Why do I feel this way? Why do I think this way? Why do I behave this way? Why am I crying? Why am I happy? What makes people prideful? What makes people ashamed? If you think about it, uh, for the entire history of mankind, humankind, all we've done is think about these things. So the first brand of psychology that's existed, that's as old as society itself, is the, um, is, uh, the study of human being. This idea of the age of philosophy. Okay? Now, the intellectual pursuit. So if you go back in history and look back at all of the different philosophers that existed from thousands and thousands of years ago to relatively uh, recently, what you're going to notice is that all of these philosophers for thousands of years have been contemplating what it means to be a human being. I don't know if you know this, but the first theory of psychology probably came from the, uh, from the Egyptians who uh, supported what we call the cardiocentric theory of human functioning. Did you know that the uh, Egyptians thought that the part of your body that controls you is your heart? And that's why 
when they embalmed people, when they made mummies, they would take careful pains to save the heart and put it in a jar and to bury it with the, with the mummy for the afterlife. But you know what? They'd pull the brain right out of the nose and throw it in the garbage can because they didn't think the brain was important at all. Now, a thousand years later, the great Greeks figured out that it wasn't the heart that controls human beings. It's actually the brain that controls human beings. And they championed this theory called cephalocentrism, which was the idea that the brain controls the uh, body and not the heart. And this is the foundation of what we would now call in modern psychology, biopsychology, right? Now, I don't know if you've ever heard, some people might say, hey, do I follow my heart or do I follow my head? When people say that, they are actually referring back to these old thousands of years old theories. Uh, the Egyptians would have said, you must follow your heart. The Greeks would, would have said, follow your uh, brain, right? And you here in modern 21st century America are, are wondering, I don't know, should I follow my head or my heart? Those two statements represent these philosophical beliefs that are thousands and thousands of years old. If you believe in karma, the idea that doing bad things will lead to bad outcomes for yourself, in a sense, that's sort of a stress and well-being theory of human functioning, saying that if we do and think the right things, we'll be stress-free and happy. You know what? When we get to the later chapters in psychology, I'm going to talk to you about how you can live a happier life full of well-being. And in a sense, we're going to be harking back to the research and the, the, to the thought that's thousands of years ago uh, that comes from Hinduism, Buddhism, and other branches of psychology, uh, philosophy. Now, uh, I'm not here to preach you a lesson on Christianity, but if you are a Christian and go back to chapter one of your textbook, the Bible, what you're going to see is that they talk about original sin, this idea of Adam eating the apple and gaining knowledge and forever being cast out of Eden. Now, in a sense, that though it's couched in, in, in religious terms that were understood back then to Christians back then, this is a theory on the nature of humankind. And this theory says that humans are basically born evil and they have to be trained to be good. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that humans are born good and are co-opted into being evil? Or do you believe that people are normally born evil and have to be controlled by laws? Depending upon your belief, you are adopting an orientation about how human beings function down at their deepest core. When we talk about uh, nature and nurture later on in this semester in the psychoanalytic perspective, we're going to ask the question, are humans born essentially good or are they born essentially evil? And what you're going to notice through thousands of years is you're going to notice that there are these philosophical questions where people asked and wanted to know uh, what is it that makes a human being a human? How do they think? How do they feel? And how do they behave? So even though, let's go back to this, even though we think about psychology as being a relatively new science, people have been asking philosophical questions for thousands and thousands of years. So I'm going to say, really, the first epic, the first period of psychology is what we might call the philosophical or pre-scientific brand of psychology. And that lasted from as long as we have recorded documents up to the 1800s. So that's what I'm going to say, sort of 35 100 BC to 1800. However, these psychologists were engaged in the intellectual pursuit of what it means to be human. They were doing the essential definition, but they weren't doing what we would essentially call the academic definition of psychology because they weren't engaging in the scientific study of, uh, of human beings. Now, I'm going to disappear for a second so I can show you this screen. Now, from 1800, or let's say 1850 to 1900, I would argue to you that psychology was in the process of being born. So let's think about the second epoch or age of psychology 
as being the birth of psychology, which occurred from around 18, during the 19th century, from 1800 to, to 1900. And again, you'll notice that I have up here written in red bold the scientific study on how people think, because it was this shift from a philosophical thought-based, uh, logical-based uh, approach to studying the human being to what we would call a scientific base that really, really, really turns psychology uh, from this philosophical thing to what we now know of as scientific psychology. What does it mean to be scientific? Well, you know what? Scientific means you measure things. You observe things and you measure things. Now, each and every one of you can tell me why you think someone is good or why someone is bad. You might tell me why you think someone can remember something or forget something. But unless you measure it, unless you provide me measurements that prove your theory, that support your theory, you are not being scientific. So science is a is a, is a process of observing and measuring the world that you are interested in. Philosophers use logical reasoning, but modern psychologists use something beside logical reasoning. They use the scientific method. We're going to talk about the scientific method more in detail next week, but I just want to talk to you about the birth of psychology. Now, how was psychology born? Actually, if you look down here, now there was a period in the 1700s when we had what we would call pseudoscientific attempts at psychology. This guy named Anton Mesmer, Mesmer, I don't know if you've ever heard of mesmerism, if you've ever been mesmerized, but it comes from this guy, Anton Mesmer, who thought that people had uh, magnetic fields around them and he would wave uh, magnets to try and fix their mag magnetic fields, not science. There was a guy named Franz Gall who thought that you could tell people's personality by measuring the bumps on their head, not psychology. And there was a guy uh, who had a horse named Clever Hans that he swore could understand and answer questions and stomp its hoofs to answer math questions. But he was actually uh, a con man and a fraud. And these were all, if you will, uh, uh, fake attempts at being psychologists. Now, why was it so hard? Up until 1950, the 1850s, this fellow named Gustav Fechner, it was commonly believed that human minds did not obey systematic processes. The idea was that you can't measure a mind because the mind is not systematic. It's not scientifically measurable. Now, this may sound silly to all of you who grew up in a life full of tests and measurements and evaluations, you know the mind can be measured, so it's hard for you to imagine this. But in 1850, when Gustav Fechner was around, everybody thought that you could not scientifically measure the mind. Now, what Gustav Fechner did was he introduced this thing called the just noticeable difference. This was universally agreed to be the first time anybody showed that the mind was A, systematic, and that the B, the mind could be measured. And what he demonstrated uh, was this thing called the just noticeable difference. He found that objects have to change 140th, sensory experiences have to change 140th of their original intensity for the human being to detect the change. So look over here on this side of the screen. You'll see I have a standard ball and I have three balls, one, two, and three. My question to you is which of these balls is a different color than the standard? Is it ball one? Is it ball two? Is it ball three? Now, most of you probably say, you know what? Ball one looks exactly like the standard. Ball two probably is different, and ball three is definitely different. Fantastic. You've seen that I've varied the color intensity on these three balls to be a little bit different from the standard. Now, in point of fact, Ball one is the same, is different than the standard, but it probably looks the same to you. And that's because it didn't change enough for you to detect the change. Ball two, maybe you can see it. Ball three, you definitely can tell the color has changed. In a sense, this is a demonstration of what's known as the just noticeable difference. And it turns out whether or not you're looking at weight, whether or not you're looking at light intensity, whether or not you're looking at how sweet something tastes, 
Something has to change one fortieth of its original intensity for a human being to detect that change. Now, this may not seem impressive to you, but in 1850, this was like discovering bread or electricity. People were like, holy cow, you can actually measure the mind. And so this, I would argue, 1851, was when psychology was born as a science. And that would be Gustav Fechner. If you're interested in learning more about the JND, click on the link I have down here and you can read about how Gustav Fechner did his research. Now, uh, 1850 to 1900 was still sort of the birth of psychology and two other few people, uh, men, were important in the development of psychology, as, the birth of psychology as a science in the 1800s. This guy, Wilhelm Wundt, in Germany, he opened the first psych lab in Germany. And in fact, chapter one's even going to mention his name because this is really important. He was the first person to award PhDs. Before Wilhelm Wundt opened his lab in 1879, you could not be a psychologist because the degree, the area of specialization, didn't exist. But in 1879, Wilhelm Wundt opened his first scientific lab and started handing out PhDs. So, uh, we have a science we can measure. We now have scientists who will do the measure. And we need one thing. This guy named William James, an American philosopher, wrote what's considered to be the first psychology textbook. It's a two-volume series, and it's literally about 12 to 14 inches thick if you put both books on top of themselves. It was a huge book. And he is generally considered to be the father of American psychology because he sort of identified all the problems and things we need to be studying in his textbook. His textbook is actually a roadmap for psychology in the 20th century. Now, I do apologize. In the 8th, 19th century, females were not really accepted into the professional sciences, so you're not going to find a lot of mothers of psychology in the 19th century. Now, we're going to have some very important women appearing in the 20th century, but in the 19th century, we were, we were still pretty sexist uh, with things, and honestly, uh, racist too. So most of the early psychologists were white male Europeans. But what I want you to understand and for your writing assignment is I want you to appreciate how these three men helped give birth to this scientific thing called psychology. And what we move from, I'm going all the way back to slide one, we move from the pre-scientific period of psychology where people thought about what it meant to be human to this period of psychology where we turned it from a philosophy into a science. So that's the first two epics of psychology. Now, I want to introduce you, uh, oh, one side note I do want to, uh, to, to put into this second epic of psychology. What you're going to find in every psych textbook, what you're going to find in every psych textbook is that they're going to talk about the theory of evolution. And you might say, how is the theory of evolution related to psychology? Well, specifically, it's actually a theory broader than psychology. It can be applied to psychology, but it was really designed to explain how the animal kingdom arose and why we see the variation in the animal kingdom. And uh, there are three broad principles. The idea that animals vary in their genetic instructions, which makes them look different. Um, uh, some of their, the environment is difficult and not all organisms can survive. And some of these organisms that are varied, that have differences that make them better able to use the environment, uh, they tend to survive more easily than the other animals. That's the selection pressure. And this idea that some genes survive and some genes don't creates evolution or change in that particular species. Now, my point here today is not to argue evolution for you. Not at all. What I want you to understand is the legacy of Darwin's theory. Along with developing a scientific I, uh, orientation towards 
uh, human beings. The most important thing about Darwin is he moved human beings from angels, things beyond the course of study. He moved them into the animal kingdom and allowed us to understand that human beings could be studied just like animals. And so the weird thing was, uh, in fact, if you talk to some people and you start mentioning evolution, they're going to get really angry and say, uh, humans were not a, are not a part of the animal kingdom. These people came from God. They were created by this deity or that deity. That was the old belief. Now, there are some people who still believe that. But what Darwin did in 1859 was he, for the first time, told scientists it's okay to think of the human being as being part of the animal kingdom that can be studied scientifically. So the real importance of Darwin's theory is not that we learned anything about evolution, although that is going to be important next week. Really, what he did was he allowed us to shift our belief from human beings above and beyond the, the ability to be studied scientifically. He moved us into, uh, into uh, what we would call the... Um, uh, he moved us into the animal kingdom so that we could be uh, we could be studied scientifically. There you go. I'm gonna get my background. It's not helping me. I hope that makes sense. So that represents the second second epic of psychology. Now here's the deal. In 1900, psychology really hadn't gone anywhere, other than having a textbook and degrees and a uh, belief that we could measure the mind, nobody really had a good idea about how we should study the human being. So what I want you to know is that from 1900 to 1950 uh, is what I would like to think of as the third epoch of psychology. And during this period, they, we developed uh, half a dozen different ways of studying the human being. Now, Here's the deal. When you're studying something as complex as a human being, or if you're studying something as complex as the animal kingdom, you sometimes, there are more than one way to study uh, that organism, right? So if you think about it, as a human being, you could study me chemically and look at the chemicals in my body. You could study me anatomically and look at the organs in my body, right? Or you could look at the culture and environment that I uh, find myself in. So if I ask the question, why are people the way they are? You can give me a chemical explanation. You can give me an anatomical explanation. Or you can give me a cultural explanation. Now what happened in psychology from 1900 to 1950 is we developed different explanatory lenses or different schools of thought that focused on trying to understand the human being from different angles. Each of these schools of thought is valuable and each of these schools of thought still exists in the field of psychology. Now, if you look over here, you'll notice that I've got live links to short videos for each of these six perspectives. Uh, in completing your homework assignment, you might have to look at these links. And in order to do the writing assignment for a grade of B or an A, uh, you're probably going to need to look in these links and watch these short videos to appreciate these different areas, uh, uh, these different schools of thought, right? Now, I'm just briefly going to go over them. The psychoanalytic people thought that the best way to understand people was to understand the early unconscious traumas that happened in their life. How many of you have ever been embarrassed so bad that there's something you want, don't want to think about? How many of you have experienced a trauma, something horrible that you try to put out of your mind? Do you know what PTSD is, where people have these traumatic events and later in life these traumatic events come back and haunt them? If you're familiar with that, if there's something that's bothering you from childhood that embarrasses you, that you can't talk about, and you think that that's the most important part of who you are, you are probably uh, interested in the psychoanalytic theory of psychology. And a fellow named Sigmund Freud was the father of the psychoanalytic theory. Now, I come from a social background, a social psychological background. 
and I know that peer pressure is a real thing. How many of you did something stupid in high school that you knew was wrong, but you did it because you wanted your friends to like you? Maybe you smoked a cigarette, maybe you drank a beer, maybe you smoked some marijuana, and you knew it was wrong, but you wanted your friends to like you. How many of you have ever been affected by peer pressure? If you have, then you understand and appreciate the idea that human beings are social animals. Uh, other people affect us. Now, if you've ever trained a dog to shake hands, to fetch the paper, to sit, to uh, poop outside, not to poop inside, if you've ever trained an animal to do something, to learn a behavior, you uh, uh, are a behavior. You are supporting the behavioral perspective, and so the behavioral perspective says humans are actually trained animals. And the reason that you do things is because somebody rewarded you for doing those things. And the reason that you don't do some things is because people punish you for doing those things. Right? Humanistic psychologists. Humanistic psychologists argue humans are different than animals. Yes, we have animal-like tendencies, but we also have hope, faith, belief, optimism. And so the humanists studied that aspect of human functioning. If you've ever heard of Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow was a humanistic psychologist. Now, in 1940, this thing called the computer was created. And computers are thinking machines. In a sense, a computer is kind of like an electronic brain. And so cognitive psychologists say, hey, humans aren't animals. They're actually computers, and they process information just like computers. And then finally, there are uh, human beings who are, there are psychologists who look at how culture affects our behavior. Is everybody the same psychologically, or are there fundamental differences in how human beings perceive and function in the world based upon the culture that they come from? So, from 1900 to 1950, we had different famous psychologists that came out and said, this is the best way to study human beings. Sigmund Freud said the best way to do it is to study us as conflicted animals. Uh, 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 Max Wertheimer, the social psychologist, said, no, the best way to study human beings is as group animals. B.F. Skinner, the behavior, said, no, the best way to study human beings is as animals that become trained like dogs and cats, right? Um, Abraham Maslow said, no, 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 human beings, we need to study exactly what makes them different from animals in order to understand the human being. Cognitive psychologists uh, like Frank McGuire uh, and Jack Block and some of these other cognitive psychologists said, no, human beings aren't animals, they're computers. And then uh, Marcus Kitayama and some of the cultural psychologists say, yeah, we're animals, but our culture, our early upbringing and the cultural artifacts that we live around really fundamentally affect who, the, who we are and who and how we function. And so over the course of the semester, we're going to revisit the human animal. We're going to revisit the psychological functioning of the human being. And sometimes we're going to talk about trauma. Sometimes we're going to talk about group pressure. Sometimes we're going to talk about learning. Sometimes we're going to talk about the human aspect of humans. Sometimes we're going to talk about how we're similar to computers. And sometimes we're going to talk about culture. In a sense, we're approaching the understanding of how people think, feel, and behave from different angles. And each one of these angles has something very important to say about how humans function. Now, as you're listening to my lecture, I'll bet you one of these six approaches probably feels more right to you than others. You know, you might think that conflict and trauma is the most important thing. You might, like me, think that uh, the social environment's the most important thing. You might think that you can train animals, humans, just like animals. Or you might be a cognitive psychologist and just focus on uh, information processing. 
each and every one of these approaches that developed from 1900 to 1950 is an important way of looking at and studying the human being. So what I'd like for you to do is to go through and watch these short videos introducing each of these major perspectives on how to study human beings. Okay. Now, Epic Four, Psychology as a Professional Discipline. All right, now here's the deal. Uh, psychology, up until about 1950, was the Wild West. You could become any kind of psychologist you wanted with any kind of training you wanted. And in fact, some of the most famous psychologists that we're going to talk about from this period didn't even have PhDs. They weren't even real psychologists, but they were considered experts in these different fields. So for example, when we talk about the psychodynamic psychology, I'm going to talk about Eric Erickson, a very famous developmental psychologist that all the nursing students are going to have to learn about. You know what? Eric Erickson didn't even have a college degree, but he was a famous psychologist. Now, in 19, uh, after World War II, psychology said, you know what, we got to get rid of all this monkey business and we got to become more professional. And you know what, they looked at the American Medal Medical Association, the AMA, who was very, very professional and they had areas of specialization. And psychologists said, you know what, it would be better, we could better help people if we were more professional, just like the medical doctors. And in fact, after World War II, there was a really huge need for clinical psychologists because World War II created lots of people with PTSD. Now they called it battle fatigue uh, back in World War II, but it was PTSD. They had a lot of people coming home from World War II with a lot of psychological problems. And there were people who were wounded with shrapnel in their brains. And psychology really needed to step up its game and really start helping people. So in 1944, the APA changed and became way more professional. Now you can read about the history and how that became a gap uh, in number one in, under On Your Own. But one of the more important things that psychology did was they created what were known as professional subfields of psychology. Now, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to say that somebody's a cardiologist? It means they're a doctor, but they know everything about the heart. Now, does a cardiologist know about treating uh, people's feet? Nope. If you wanted to get your feet treated, you would go to a podiatrist which is a medical doctor that specializes in the feet. If you were pregnant, you don't go to a cardiologist. You go to an OBGYN that specializes in treating uh, uh, females and specifically females who are pregnant. If you had a problem, if you needed brain surgery, you wouldn't go to a cardiologist. You wouldn't go to a podiatrist. You would go to a neurologist, right? Now, what that means is and the deal is, if you get trained as a cardiologist, you can't start working on people's feet. If you get trained as a podiatrist, you can't start delivering babies. These professional subfields tell you what you are allowed to do. Now, after 1944, psychology adapted the same exact model that the AMA did. I am a social psychologist. My diploma, if you look at my diploma that hangs on the wall, it doesn't say Chris Roddenberry is a doctor of psychology. It says Chris Roddenberry is a doctor of social psychology. Now, why is this important? Every time I go to a cocktail party with my wife, she's in business and none of her friends know about psychology. Every time I meet somebody new and they find out I'm a psychologist, they say, oh my gosh, you could really help my family. We have lots of psychological problems. And I smile and I think to myself, nope not that kind of psychologist. Do you know what kind of a psychologist you go to if you're having psychological problems? You don't go to a social psychologist. You go to a clinical psychologist, right? You know, if you, um, 
If you are having trouble quitting drugs or quitting cigarettes or you want to lose weight and you just can't seem to get your way onto a diet, you know what you do? You go to a behavioral psychologist and they will help you with that. Okay? Um, if you want to study how children learn language or how children's personalities develop, you have to become a developmental psychology. So what I want to do, uh, if you click on the link number two, what it's going to do is it's going to show you the subfields of psychology. Hopefully you can see that link right now. Now there are actually 52, I think 52 or maybe a few more professional psychological subfields. You can be 52 different types of psychologists. But what you've got right here are the most common subfields of psychology. So there are neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists, and actually cognitive neurosciences psychologists. There are environmental psychologists. There are clinical psychologists. There are counseling psychologists. There are developmental psychologists. Experimental psychologists actually study our senses, how we smell, how we taste, how we hear things. Uh, there are some psychologists who work in court settings. They're called forensic psychologists. If you want to uh, work in business settings, you need to either be a human factor psychologist or an industrial organizational psychologist, an IO psychologist. Um, and you know what? I am a social psychologist. Some of you may even want to help athletes perform better. If you did, you would become a sports psychologist. So, in a sense, each of these subfields are different degrees that you can get. And, what, uh, and, and what's happened in the last 40 years is psychology has gone from a discipline, a crazy discipline, to a very organized discipline. It's sort of like... Uh, the AMA, okay? And so if you want to understand where psychology comes from, you have to understand that, number one, psychology has been with us ever since we've been able to think about what it means to be a human. The first epic of psychology I'll call non-scientific or non-scientific or philosophical psychology. From 1800 to 1900, psychology was born as a science. Remember, we had Gustav Fechner, uh, Wilhelm Wundt, uh, Charles Darwin, and, uh, and, uh, and, and William James, who helped give birth to this science called psychology. In the 1900s, early 1900s, different psychologists became famous and created sort of the different approaches to thinking about why humans are the way they are. And now we are in what I would call modern psychology, which psychology is as scientific and as organized as the medical field. Now, right before I let you go, I do want you to know that actually in the last 10 or so years, we're actually moving into what I would call the fifth epic of psychology. And it's the melding of computers and humans. All right. So we've gotten so good with human psychology and we've got so good with computers that they are starting to work together. And now uh, we're doing things like creating artificial intelligence, humans, uh, computers that can act like humans. We're now uh, creating bionics, human beings who can now control prosthetic limbs, which are bionic. I would say in the next 20 or 30 years, during your lifetime, we are going to move into epic number five, where computers and humans come together and we become the cyborg generation. Being a little bit uh, funny there, but in a sense, it's coming. All right, so here's the deal. This is the first lecture, and I just wanted to give you an introduction. You need to know the definition of psychology and why modern psychology is different than philosophy. It's a science. And then for your writing assignment, the optional writing assignment, if you're going to do that to make an A or B in this class, what I want you to do is to be able to explain to me and to other people 
how psychology has evolved to become from philosophy, ancient philosophy, to the modern field of science that we have now. Um, you know what? That's all I have to say today. I'd like to thank you for watching this lecture. I do apologize that the live broadcast didn't go off uh, well, but I will get that fixed. And next Monday, we will start with the uh, uh, a live broadcast at the original broadcast time of 1.30. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me a text or an email. I look forward to meeting you and talking to you about psychology in the future. Have a great day. Bye.